Hello and welcome to this at XLA Level Geography Walking Talking Mock for December 2020. Hopefully giving you more confidence in reading and interpreting the questions so you can give the best answers possible. So just a quick note uh, while you're watching this. Because this is done in halfway through year 13, we've not covered all of the course yet. So we've not covered the carbon cycle. Therefore, what I've had to do is mash up two different papers so they focus purely on the water questions. So normally question four would be made up of water and carbon based questions. Normally what's happened is the explained questions have been on one topic, either water or carbon, and the assess and evaluate questions have been on the other topic, either water or carbon, the one that hasn't been before. There is normally some links and synopticity between the two in the essay questions. Um, but please note that these essay questions will only be covered very briefly because there are a whole range of other videos that go into the essay planning in much greater depth and it would make this video far too long. So let's jump straight in and question one is going to be about tectonic processes and hazards. Now, in total, this is only worth 16 marks, so only a small proportion overall, despite all of the fantastic work that you've done. It's likely to be that the first four marks are going to be based on a resource of some type. And as you can see here, we've got this table ranking the number of deaths and the tsunami wave height uh, after the 2011 Tohoku tsunami. Now, we can see we've got these ranked together. And we've got the values for the difference in the rank D and D squared. Now, immediately you might start panicking, thinking, oh, this is going to be a statistics question. But don't worry, because you will be given most of the information you need and the formula. Now, as we look here, if we look at it straight away, if we just compare the data and we think, well, if we look at the ranks, Straight away, we're thinking, is there a relationship between them? And as you can see, we've got them in rank order on uh, the left hand side down here. And we've got the tsunami heights. Now, you can see there isn't much of a pattern there. So that should give you a clue as to what the possible answers or questions could be about. So let's have a look at the question then. So we've got the formula for Spearman's rank which is just here. However, the exam board has printed a mistake because it should read R equals one minus the rest of the formula. So six sum of D squared over N cubed minus N. So what you would need to do is you work out the value for D squared and the sum of D squared. And you could write that in there to help you. And then all you would do is it's worth three marks. So you probably want three stages put in there. So you can just transfer the information, remembering that N is the number of samples and put that into the working. Then do the next stage and work that out. So pause the video, have a go at that now. OK, so you've done that. So what you should have is this is your first stage. So you'd get one mark for that. Another mark for breaking it down here. And then finally, a mark for the answer. But remember, you must make sure you write the answer in the correct place here. So write that in. So hopefully you got that right. So the next question. The table below shows the critical values and you can see you've got these three numbers here and it gives you a null hypothesis that there is no significant relationship and the hypothesis. Now, please do not panic about this. If you can't remember the difference between the two and how you work those out, don't panic because it's only worth one mark. Do not let it shock you too much. But what you need to do is take that value from before have a look at these significance tables and if the number is greater than these at the different levels of uh, significance, then you would reject the null hypothesis and accept the hypothesis. So think back to that number. Would you accept or reject? 
And the answer, of course, 0 0.28 is a smaller number than all of these. Therefore, you would have to accept the null hypothesis and say there is no relationship. So shockingly, we're straight into the first essay writing. Now, as I've said before, I'm only going to cover these very briefly. But it is very important to read the question carefully. Now, we know that the command word is going to be assess on this one. And here we've got to assess the importance of something. So as we look at, well, what are we looking for? Well, we've got to say how valuable are tectonic hazard profiles in understanding the severity of impacts. But the key thing is to remember that you've got a restriction here resulting from earthquake events. So we've got to make sure that we focus those areas. So we're looking at saying how important are hazard profiles, which is the physical characteristics of the hazard event, in this terms, the earthquake. So looking at the key features of magnitude, aerial extent, frequency. And we've got to put it in understanding the severity of impacts. So how important are those features, magnitude, in telling us how bad the impacts are likely to be? But also, we've got to think about those unwritten elements of the question. What are the other factors which are important in understanding the severity of impacts? And as we will know from the disaster risk equation, that that is going to be the hazard itself, the hazard profile, times the vulnerability over the capacity to cope. And what are two of the main areas that look at vulnerability and capacity to cope? You would want to be mentioning development and governance. But you could also mention those geographical factors such as population density, remoteness, urban versus rural, etc. So you would have to be working on planning all of those into your answer. So pause the video and have a go at writing a plan now. Well, as you've written in your plan, yeah, have a look. Have you made sure that you're going to do the correct things for assess? What case studies are you looking to include? And remember that you've got to be talking about earthquakes, not volcanoes, not tsunamis. Keep it focused on earthquakes. And then you need to say why the factors are relevant, but also which factors may reduce their impact or lead to different outcomes as well. And remember the structure of it. We have our introduction. What are the key terms? So what is a hazard profile? What, is, what do we mean by the severity of impacts? Yep, focusing on earthquakes, but also briefly mention the other factors that you're going to discuss. And then remember, explicit judgment. So you might want to say the magnitude of an earthquake is a key factor in determining the severity of impacts. This was seen in. This means that. However, this is also plays another factor as seen in here. Therefore, magnitude is an important factor, but this other factor is also important as well. And then you repeat that a number of times with a very brief conclusion. So if we have a look then, so the key things that you should have spoken about, which we've already covered, we are looking at the hazard profiles, but the interactions between the physical factors and the context, but also the geographical factors as well. Now, remember, this really is your introduction. This is your knowledge, your A01. But to do well, you've got to give the evidence, but then also assess your answers as well. So now we move on to the coast question. And remember in the real exam um, that you will bypass question two because that's on glaciation and you'll probably get confused if you try and answer it. So you'll be going on to question three, which is the coastal landscape one. And remember, do read all of the instructions so you can put an X in the box here. Um, so they make sure to mark this one. So if we have a look here, this is the question study figure 3a, which shows a coastal landscape and explain how erosional processes have contributed to the formation of the features shown. And it's worth six marks.
Now it is important before you begin to answer this question that you look at the resource that is shown because for here you will get marks for relating directly to the um, information within the resource or the picture. So explain, give reasons and we need to make sure that we're linking it to show the erosional pro uh, processes and how these have contributed to the formation of the features shown. So the first thing you need to be doing is thinking, well, what features can you see here? So we have the caves that you can see. You might talk about the slight wave cut notch here. We've got the wave cut platform along here. You can also see we've got the steep cliff face possibly. And we can see because of the chalk and the bedding planes, we can see the faults in it. So what we're looking at doing is thinking what erosional processes, the hydraulic action, abrasion, attrition, solution, and how have they led to the formation of these features here? Even looking at the stack possibly. And remember that when we get to the six markers that we are level marked. And for level three, you can see five or six marks. You've got to demonstrate an accurate and relevant understanding and applies the knowledge to the information. So you've got to make sure that you're stating figure three, you can see there is a the, this erosional process led to this happening by this. And with it being six marks, ideally, you probably want to give three developed answers and reasons for this. So pause the video. Have a go now. So have a look at your answer and then have a look at what we can see here. The AO1, the knowledge, and the AO2 would be the information taken from the resource. How did you do? So let's have a look at this next question. And we have to be careful, it still relates to the same figure, but make sure you do check, do you need to look at another figure? Do you need to look at another resource to give your answer to? And again here, the question is explain how, but this time we're looking at the sub aerial processors have contributed to the development of this landscape. So again, we're looking for the evidence of sub aerial processors. So we're looking at the nature of the cliffs. And again, we could talk about the possible uh, lithology and that how that might be affected by weathering and mass movement. Yeah, we can see we've got an old stack here. We've got a stump here. Yeah, we've got the um, the straight sheer cliffs. We can see we've got this debris at the base of the cliffs. And again, we're looking at giving three developed statements to really get those six marks. So have a go at writing your answer now. OK, so have a check through the information from the mark scheme. And how did you do? Did you get all of the information? Did you manage to have the correct geographical key terms and knowledge? And did you manage to apply it effectively to what you could see in the picture? OK, so the next question again, please do check. Make sure that you don't need to refer to a resource. But in this one, we don't. So the question here is explain why hard engineering approaches are still used to protect some coastal environments. So it's worth eight marks this one. So we perhaps want to consider giving it four developed statements or three very developed statements with evidence as part of your answer. And the whole point of this is to think about the hard engineering approaches that you know about in coastal management and say, what is the value of them? Why are they still used despite knowing some of the problems of them? Why are things like groins, sea walls, um, riprap, why is it still used? Perhaps linking it to the value of the coastal landscape that is behind it. You could link it into the integrated coastal zones of management as well, so they can give it a sustainable management and how they fit into part of that. So have a think about it. How can you link those hard engineering approaches 
and using your knowledge to answer the question, not just explaining how they work, but linking it to why they're still used to protect some coastal environments. Look at the mark scheme, we can see the comments that we've got here. So have a look through your answer. Do you think that yours would fit into that? But remember, other information could be relevant. So would yours sort of fit into the patterns that these have? And remember, you'd only be looking at four of these as a maximum to get the full eight marks. But notice what are the key terms and what are the connectives which have been used here? So once we've done the explain questions on the coastal section, we then come to evaluate. So far, there hasn't been an assess question. It's always been a 20 mark evaluate question in the coasts unit. Now, this one is an outlier because it is asking you to study figure 3B. In the other exam papers that there have been, there hasn't been a resource for you to look at with the evaluate question. However, read the question, look at the resources very carefully, just in case that they do throw one in for you. Yeah, because just because they've done it one way in the past doesn't mean that they might not alter it slightly in the future. So if we look at this question, we obviously know that the command word is evaluate. So we've got to say, yeah, or evaluate the view. Yeah, how important is it? Is it right? What are the other factors that are involved? And make sure that you're putting judgment in there. Now it's asking here, or it's saying that, evaluate the view that climate change is the most important factor in influencing coastal flood risk. So there we go. So we've got the main elements to it. Now here, it's understanding the coastal flood risk. Well, what is coastal flood risk? And this can link back to tectonics that we know that the risk of a disaster mixes the physical features of a hazard along with the human attributes to it as well. And the resource that you've got here gives you a clue that it also wants you to talk about the human factors involved in coastal flood risk. Remember, if there is no one at the coast and it floods, is there a risk there? Is it a problem? So therefore, you've got to be showing that climate change is a major cause of sea level rise, which is going to include uh, increase the chances of coastal flooding. But the risk element really comes from the fact that people are staying in those areas. But also, other than climate change and leading to eustatic sea level rise, what other factors could increase the chance of coastal flooding? So, remembering what an evaluate question is, saying how important certain factors are, giving the case study evidence, and remember that you need a clear conclusion at the end. And remember the structure is very, very similar for the assess question, but you perhaps do need a third paragraph and you need a much more detailed uh, answer conclusion, which is substantiated. So giving the key bits of evidence, which would pack back up your point of view. So bearing that in mind, have a go at writing a plan for the question that we saw a second ago. And again, here is the question along with the resource. So pause the video and have a go now. Now, apologies again for rushing through these essay questions, but we do deal these with these in a lot more detail in the specific essay videos. So, as we can see, A01 is the key knowledge. And this area in A01 around here is really what should go into your introduction, but also could be a key part of your essay plan as well. 
So we know that climate change is increasing risk through the sea levels, but also through the greater magnitude and frequency of storms. However, because you've got rapid population growth um, and you've got more people living in marginal areas, that that's going to cause a problem. It could also be due to subsidence through to uh, following earthquakes, or it could be just to the weight of the uh, people on it. Or if you've got the Nile Delta, the fact that the Delta is being starved of sediment because of the dams further upstream. So plenty of ideas. Yeah, this isn't an essay as it would be written, but you can see how they are using some of those connectives such as however, yet, furthermore, that would be the kind of terms you would need to include for an evaluative essay. So again, pause the video. Have you got some of these key points in there? And as a reminder, when you're writing these essays, yeah, this simplified, more basic idea of a marking scheme. So are we, have we got all the key terms defined in the introduction? Are your key points relevant and obvious? And are you using those key terms directly throughout? Are you giving clear evidence and that's forming part of your explanation? Um, and are you using that terminology throughout as well? And for this one, have you give, given a clear and detailed conclusion using the key evidence as a basis for your point of view? OK, so now we move on to section C and question four. Remember, for the purposes of this walking, talking mock, I've mixed up two different papers so we can focus purely on the water resources here because we've not covered carbon yet. But you would expect to see a mix of these questions. Normally in the past, the explain have been one topic and the assess and evaluate another topic. But there is no nothing to suggest that that might not alter in the future. So starting off then, study figure 4a. And the question very simply is explain one reason. And that is really important. You're just giving one reason that has to be developed. Why over abstraction of groundwater could become a problem for area A. Now it's worth three marks. So what you're looking is developing your reason and then extending it a step further to get the three marks. So as you look at it, well, what can you see? If you're going to over abstract the groundwater, if you're going to take the groundwater out, what problems is that going to cause? Well, you've got granite. Yeah. How might that influence the ability of the groundwater to be recharged? You've got a very high average annual temp uh, temperature, which is going to lead to high evapotranspiration. You've also got a salt lake. Now, what might happen if that gets into the groundwater? You've got an average rainfall of only 500 millimetres. And you have flash flooding and these um, storms. So you haven't got really good conditions for water to sink in. So what is going to happen if you take too much out of the groundwater? So pause the video. Have a go now. Now, this is unusual at A level because this one is more point marked rather than level marked. But you can see in the answers that they've got there, they've talked about what the problem is and then they've given the evidence from the resource and extended that to say why it's going to lead to a problem. So there are many different other answers that you could have had, but can you see where you would have got the point marks for each of those? And is yours relevant to the question and to the resource that you saw in front of you? The next question, again, just double check, does there or is there a resource you need to refer to. In this case, there's not. So the question is, explain why river regimes might vary between basins. So it's asking you for what are the reasons that the river regimes, you've got to know what the key term river regime means. And then you've got to say why they would vary. And here we're looking at six marks. 
So you've got to think. Ideally, you probably want three key points which are well explained, or you could get away with two explained in much more detail. So think back, what does a river regime mean? Make sure you don't get it mixed up with soil moisture um, or any other factors. Yeah, so what does that mean? What is that key term mean? And what are the factors that influence it and might make it change? So pause the video, have a go now. So here is the mark scheme. Again, there could be other answers in there. But the river regime is the variation in discharge at a point in the river at different times of the year. And it might be because of they might have different climates in different basins. The geology might be different. If you look at the Yukon, you could say that it's frozen for part of the year. So you can give examples in there as well, which can be credited, although you don't necessarily need to give a description of detailed case studies. So you can pause the video, have a look, and how many marks do you think you would have got for that? So now we have a look at the next question. Explain how physical and human factors. So it's asking you to consider both. And it's how these factors contribute to an increased risk of water security. So here, you've got to understand what is meant by water insecurity. It's not just about the supply of water. We need to be talking about what are the factors that might lead to some people having or not being able to get that water. It could be pollution, it could be price. Now it's worth eight marks. So to get the eight marks, it's a level three, accurate and relevant geographical knowledge and understanding a broad range of ideas which are detailed and fully developed. So here, what we're thinking about is we could give four different points, but it needs to be balanced. Therefore, we could give two physical and two human factors, which are well developed. Again, you'd be quite right to give some very basic case study information to help with the development of your answer as well. So have a think through what are the physical factors and what are the human factors and just write out a quick plan for this. So pause the video now. So how did you get on? Again, you can pause the video, have a look at some of the answers that we've got here. Again, you don't need all of these, but you would need a balance between the physical and the human. And it's also understanding some of the key points that it's not just about supply, but it could also be about the growing demand, which can lead to scarcity. You may want to have given a definition for it, but you didn't have to on this. So again, a whole range of physical and human factors. Did you get a good balance in yours? So now again, we come on to the essay style questions. Now, from what we've seen in past papers, the assess question has referred to a resource. And it is very important that you do refer to that resource in your answer. So here we can see then assess the likely impacts. So which of the impacts are more likely to happen or how important are they going to be of changing precipitation on the hydrological processes in the drainage basins shown? OK, so it's very important that you have got these three drainage basins. And it's important that you refer to the different factors that we have here. And we look talking about the hydrological processes. So we don't necessarily need to focus on ecosystems or what problems it's going to cause. It's how it's going to affect the processes within those drainage basins. So if we have a look at number one, what can you see? Well, for a majority of the drainage basin, there is a reduction in millimetres now. So we can see there's a reduction of um, 
between 20 and 50 millimeters. Now, we need to look here that this is annual precipitation levels. It's also gonna expect you to know some key background information to these areas. So is 50 millimeters a year, is that going to be a big impact on somewhere that has three or four meters? Or be careful in case this was about the percentage level change, because that would make it a very different answer. So make sure you read the resources very carefully. So have a look through the information you can see on the resource. Yeah. First of all, you need to comment on the changing precipitation. Then you need to consider how that would affect the hydrological processes in each of these three different areas. How do you think you would structure your essay? Could it be that you do one paragraph on each of the different areas? And how are you going to assess the likely impacts of it? OK, so it might be how likely are these impacts to happen? Is it going to create a massive difference in one? Whereas we look at two, there's not much change. So is it going to cause any difference at all? And three, there is more. But is it going to be a different type of precipitation? Yeah, we know in the Yukon it might normally fall as snow. So if it happens as rain, is that going to change the process? So have a look at the resources, have a go at the answer, pause the video now. So you've had a go at your answer and your plan. Um, you're probably going to need to pause the video again in a moment and just read through the different statements. But were you on the right lines? Did you talk about the correct elements of the hydrological processes? Were you talking about it being stored in the cryosphere in the Yukon? As I mentioned, did you mention about the changes in soil moisture levels and how this might affect evaporation and evapotranspiration? Have you talked about how it might increase in runoff um, and in increases of uh, water surplus in different areas? So pause the video and just have a look now and see how well you think you did. And finally, we have the last evaluate question. So here then the command word is evaluate the view. And here we've got to look at the different approaches to managing water insecurity. And we're saying that are some of them more sustainable than others. So here we've got to link our knowledge and understanding of what are the different approaches to water, managing water insecurity, and how do they link to sustainability? Now, sustainability, you've got to remember, you've got to consider that it's linking in economic, environmental and social aspects. And you could take the approaches view of hard and soft, but you might also want to mention the more holistic and integrated approaches. Think of the case studies that you're going to use in here. So it might be the China North South project. It could be the Three Gorges Dam. You might want to talk about um, using water more efficiently. It could be about the integrated approach that we saw in Singapore. It could be the water transfer in the UK. It could be the desalination plants. And it's linking them into this idea that for it to be a sustainable, perhaps none of the approaches are sustainable on their own. Even if you had rainwater capture, um, supported by NGOs as a bottom up project, while it would be beneficial for small communities, would it be beneficial for a much wider, densely populated area? So you're looking at really evaluating those different viewpoints. So again, have a think about it and plan your essay out now. And here we have the ideas from the mark scheme. Now, remember, this is not an essay. It is not written in an essay style. It also doesn't expect you to cover all of these different areas. But what you can see in some of the terminology that it does have the evaluation, the howevers, the in some cases, yet others, importantly, um, and therefore. 
So it's using those connectives to develop their argument. OK, the ideas I spoke about for the A01 are up in this bit. And then it's also important to remember your substantiated conclusion, which may look a little bit like it is at the bottom here. So you're making a judgment as you go through. So I know this was very brief on the essays. Well done if you've made it this far, but it does give you a chance to see what the exam will look like and the different types of questions, particularly the explain questions and using the resources and how you could use those effectively when you come to do your mock or your real exam. So thank you very much for watching and take care. Bye.